Amen. Good morning once again. And uh, we're glad to see everyone here. We welcome to our visitors. And we pray that uh, this uh, time of uh, fellowship with us will be a blessing to you. And most of all, we pray that the Lord will be uh, speaking to your hearts uh, in whatever way that he, he will knock into your heart. Uh, if, you have not, if you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord, I pray that you open your hearts as we listen to the Word of God and see our condition in the sight of God. And um, make that all-important decision in our lives. And if uh, you are a believer and you know that there are things that God uh, has been working in your heart, uh, I pray that you will also open your heart and humble yourself to be able to respond to the message. And the message today, we have read our text in 2 Corinthians 7 a while ago. And as, as you have noticed in the late, later part of the uh, chapter, Paul talks about repentance. And we're going to be talking about that uh, more today. I have preached uh, messages about repentance, but let's see. Uh, repentance here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and we will be remaining in this chapter so I would like to ask everyone to open their Bibles there and um, keep your Bibles open we don't have a I don't have any points this uh, uh, morning it's not that it's a pointless message it's a pointless message literally because there are no points but but we are going to drive home a point okay so uh, we're just going through uh, the verses from verse 1 to 16. And then we'll see, uh, actually, for those, for those visitors, we've been going through 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now we're here at chapter 7. And for, for the most part of chapter 1 to 6, it has been very, uh, what do you call, Paul has been talking in a negative tone. He's been rebuking, he's been correcting, he's been uh, telling these people what they have done wrong, what they should do right. But then here in chapter 7, it's the first Actually, it's the first uh, time that Paul is joyful in what he's writing. It's the first time that he's expressing joy that, uh, believe it or not, comes from these same people who brought him so much grief. And then as we read this chapter, we see here the heart. We, as, as we go through this book, we see the heart of the Apostle Paul. And we see the heart of a man of God, heart towards the member. What kind of heart does he have? Does he have any disdain towards the members? Does he, have, does he hate them? Or is his desire really to reconcile them to God? And to do whatever he can, to write whatever he can in order, in order to convince them to repent and do what's right in the sight of the Lord. And this is what we're going to see here this morning here in St. Corinthians chapter 7. And as a way of review before I go to the preaching, last week he, uh, we have talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, in, the in the last part of that chapter, Paul has been talking about, um, I have loved you, you have not loved me back because you have been loving the world. That is what he's saying. So now, here in chapter 7, he's asking them again to do that, and now he, uh, and then he received good news in the middle of this chapter. So we're going to go through that, and I pray that um, we keep an attitude of um, called openness of mind and heart because you know and the best preacher can come here and preach the best pastor can come here and preach I mean, Spurgeon can come out of his grave and preach to us but if our attitude towards the Word of God is wrong it will never work at all if we are not going to submit ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit while the preaching is going on there's nothing the preaching is not going to accomplish anything in you Again, it's not about the preacher, it's about the message. It's not about you, actually. It's not about what you think. It's about what God wants you to know and what God wants to say here in the Bible. So before we go to the message, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the passage that we have read a while ago. We thank you, Lord, for the message of this passage. Uh, just the plain reading of Scripture, dear Lord, uh, speaks so much, dear Lord. And um, it's very clear what we have to do, dear Lord. But sometimes... Uh, personal agendas and uh, our uh, self-desires, bitterness, or uh, selfish motives uh, get, get in the way, dear Lord, of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you bless this preaching. You bless, dear Lord, uh, you anoint my lips as I preach. May you give me wisdom. May you give me uh, more understanding in order for, the, uh, for your members to be 
uh, for the believers to be blessed, to be uh, to have more, uh, to have a clear understanding of this passage, and to see ourselves in this passage, dear Lord, what we have to do, whether we have to come to repentance in order to be saved, or to repent of the way that we have been living that is not glorifying in your name, dear Lord. I pray, Lord, that you help me. May, may you be the one to be glorified, and only your name be magnified in our midst. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, um, let's, uh, let's go, let's, as a way of introduction, let's go, to the, let's go through all the verses. Here in verse 1, it says here, Therefore, having these promises. Now, these promises are talking about, if you, if you remember, last week uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 18, Paul is telling the people, remove all these worldly influences, stop all these worldly um, thinking, worldly relationships, and the promise is, I will receive you. So God promised them that um, if you are going to stop thinking in the worldly way, if you are going to stop loving the world, you will have a better relationship with the Lord. You're going to be closer with the Lord and with the man of God. So having therefore these promises, the promise that God is going to receive us, the promise that God is going to be closer, or we're going to be closer to God if we're going to separate ourselves from the world, having therefore these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now having these promises, there are things that we have to do. Having these uh, uh, wonderful promises of God, first is we have to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. We have to remove sin. We have to cleanse ourselves from a sinful living. Now, in our lives, there, are, there is a cleansing that only God can do. When you came to repentance to the Lord and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, He has cleansed you of all iniquities and declared, declared you righteous. Okay, in the sight of God. And now you're saved. That is a cleansing that only God can do. Not of you. That means when you got saved, when you started the Christian life, when you became a believer, it was not your own cleansing. It was not your own works. It's not your, it's not your good works. Because as we can see, whatever good you can do, it will be offset by even one sin that we, did, that we do. You know, the, the, there is a misconception. Uh, yesterday I was preaching at the village. I asked the children, and I have been preaching salvation so almost for two years now. And I asked them, hey, okay, can anyone tell me here what is the way to heaven? How, what do you have to do? What decision you have to make in order to go to heaven? One, uh, one young person raised his hand and said, oh, you have to do good. And, and as a preacher, it might be frustrating because I, we emphasize repentance and faith, repentance and faith every week. And then they answer that you have to do good. It's, I understand because that is their nature. That is human nature. That is what have we have been taught. Whether you were a Catholic or you were a Buddhist before, you have been taught to do good, to keep this tradition, to keep this uh, sacrament, to keep doing this good. And maybe you can earn your way to heaven. Maybe God will allow you into heaven. Actually, for, for, for those of you who were uh, Catholics before, you are not even given assurance. Kahit na... Uh, even though you have done a lot of good things, you've done good things all your lives, we've seen devoted Catholics, we've seen them going to church, we've seen them uh, walking on their knees to the altar, doing all these things, sincere things that compared to us, uh, they, they seem more sincere in what they're doing. But the Bible says this kind of cleansing, this kind of righteousness can only be done by God. Not of yourselves, not of your good works. Because if you say that you're going to be saved through your goodness, the question is, how many good deeds do you have to do in order to earn your way to heaven? We don't know. You cannot be sure. But praise God that this cleansing God has done in our lives. When we repented of our sins and put our faith in Jesus Christ. So there's a cleansing that only God can do. But the Bible says here, Paul commanded them to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. That means even though this cleanse, one cleansing has been done, there's more cleansing that we have to do every day in our lives. That means repentance is not only once, but you have to repent every day of your life. The Bible says cleanse ourselves. Paul put himself in that category as well. He has to cleanse himself. He has as well to cleanse himself. Even though he's the one commanding, even though seemingly he's the one who knows the answer to the problems of Christian life, he still put himself there. We have to cleanse ourselves. Having therefore this promise, we have to cleanse ourselves. We have to remove all this filthiness unrighteousness in our lives not only to cleanse ourselves 
It says here, cleanse ourselves of the flesh and the spirit. Because these are two different things. You cleanse yourselves of the things that you're doing in your flesh and your spirit as well. Because most of the time, we forget the spirit part. We forget the spiritual part. It's easy for, a, for a, a person to cleanse yourselves of the flesh. If you see the ministry of Jesus Christ, all these harlots, all these tax collectors, it's easy for them to come to the Lord in repentance. Because their sin is open. People can see it. But there are people who forget that cleansing of the spirit is also important. These are the Pharisees. These are the Sadducees who think that they're good who think that they're righteous, who think that they're okay, but they, are not, they have not been cleansed by the Spirit. Okay? That's why it's easy to cleanse our flesh. It's easy to stop doing the sin if we really come to God in repentance. But every day you also have to cleanse yourselves of the Spirit. Because if you have cleansed yourself of the flesh, the, the danger is your spirit is going to be puffed up. You're going to be self-righteous. And if that comes, you're going to destroy your flesh again. That's why cleanse yourself of the flesh, do what is right, stop doing what is bad, but keep relying on the power of the Spirit to do that. Amen. Why? Because the, the cleansing of the Spirit means you rid yourself of self-righteousness, you rid yourself of bitterness, you rid, your, you rid yourself of pride, because these are the things that people cannot see. These are the things that only you know. These are the things that you know in yourself, in your life, that is stopping you from being who you, are, you have to be in the sight of God. These are the things that you can hide. You can sing in the choir and be bitter. You can sing in the choir and be self-righteous. You can preach actually and be full of pride and no one can ever know. But that is between you and God. Because the cleansing of the flesh is easy. We will not allow you to sing here while you're smoking. We will not allow you to preach here drunk. No one will do that. That's easy. It's easy to dress well. It's easy to pretend you're doing good. But, it's, it's, it, but, the, but the thing here is uh, uh, it's, it's harder to, to, to cleanse ourselves of these spiritual things that are stopping us from being what we have to be. So you cleanse yourself of the flesh and also of the spirit. The only way we can cleanse ourselves of the spirit is to fill ourselves with the word of God and prayer. And this has always been the challenge of everyone who stepped behind this pulpit and preached. The challenge is, oh, has always been to be closer to God, to read your Bible every day, to pray every day. These things seem to be the basic things of Christian lives, but these are the things that we fail to do all the time. It's hard to cleanse our spirit if you fail to do this, if you're not getting closer to God, if you're not knowing more about the Lord Jesus Christ. We teach the children the song, read your Bible, pray every day. Why? Because this is the basics of Christianity. It's the manual. You get saved, you read the Bible. You get saved, you get taught to pray. But these are the things that we forget. Sometimes even pastors, now they forget to pray. Especially when you, you think you know a lot already, you stop reading the Bible. You think you know a lot of doctrine, you stop studying the Bible. You think you're already accomplishing a lot for God, you stop praying because you think you can do it yourself. But if you stop, even though you have been a long time Christian, that's the time you will fail. You will not be protected from self-righteousness. That's why it's important, very important to always read, to always pray, to get closer to the Lord. You can never exhaust the treasure that you can find in the Bible. You can read a book over and over and over again in your life and you will still find new things that God will show into you and to improve your life. Until God takes us home, until or until God comes, we should never stop doing that. Cleanse ourselves of the flesh and the spirit. Minsan, corny na lang ulit ulit. But hey, am I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask you, do you not fail to read your Bible every day? Oh, you keep on repeating that preacher, but you keep on failing to do that. You keep on repeating to pray, to, uh, you, preacher, but you keep on failing to pray. You know, it seems that we can preach about this every Sunday and, and not everyone will still be doing it. Yeah. So you have to emphasize that. Now, to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness and of the flesh and also of the spirit. And there's something that we have to do to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Not only to get rid of the bad things, not only to let go of the bad things, but to keep on doing good. Amen. Perfecting holiness. It, this, this doesn't talk about sinless perfection. The word perfecting means here is uh, being complete, being whole. That means you don't only stop what the bad things, but you keep on doing good. Because the moment you stop doing good, what are you going to do? 
you will default back to doing the bad things. That's why every day you strive to do good. Every day you do, uh, make an effort to do good. Because the moment you stop doing that, you're going to do bad again. Because our nature's default is to do bad. Our nature's default is to do sin. That's why it's an, it's, it's an uphill climb to keep on doing good. And if you get tired, you're going to go back there. The Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. That's why not only uh, let go of sin, but also keep on doing what's right. This is the life of a Christian. It doesn't, it doesn't finish the moment you got on your knees and then repented of your sin and put your faith in Christ. It does not end there. It actually only started there. It is an everyday life of repentance and doing good and God coming to the Lord, asking God for help, asking the Holy Spirit for power to, to say no to sin and to do good. Amen. This is what the Paul, Paul is saying. Having this promise is not only the promise of God being closer to God, but uh, us being closer to God. But Paul has said a lot of promises to these Corinthian people. He has told them, he has taught them the whole counsel of God, knowing what God has promised them. Because of this, Cleanse yourself from filthiness and keep doing what's right. The, uh, the ver next verse says, verse 2, receive us. Okay, Paul here again is like, like in chapter 16 talking about, uh, uh, I, have been hope open. I have been open to you, I have loved you, now please love us. It's the same thing. The Bible, uh, Paul says here, receive us. Open your hearts for us. Last, uh, the, the previous chapter he says that you have a lot of room in our hearts. But we don't have a place in your hearts. Why? Because you've filled your hearts with the world. You're, you have filled your hearts with the filthiness of this world. Therefore, re rid yourselves of that. Remove that from your heart. And then love us instead. Okay? Receive us. You know, because, because Paul, uh, people here have accused Paul of not being a prophet. Have accused Paul of not being used of God. They have accused Paul of not being, uh, of, of being too... Uh, abusive of his authority but now Paul is saying remove those things from your heart and you know who I am you know what I am it's not just as if you don't know who I am you just have to remember that and stop listening to unbelievers okay receive us we have wronged no man we have corrupted no man we have defrauded no man this is not new information to the Corinthian people Hindi to bagong balita. They have known this all their lives. They have known this all their Christian lives. They cannot point to Paul and prove that he has really wronged any man. He has not done any bad things to any man. Even though the time when he went there and, and tried to correct a lot of things, he didn't do bad to, to people. Paul made sure that he's not going to be blamed because of these things. We have wronged no man, he said. We have corrupted no man. Wala kami sinira ng buhay. We have not destroyed any lives here. That's what Paul said. And they know that. Their lives have been better comparing to when they were unbelievers to now that they're serving the Lord. We have not corrupted any of you. We have taught you what is right. We have not taught you what is wrong. We have not corrupted you. We have defrauded no man. I, we, have not taken uh, we have not taken advantage of you. We did not take advantage of you. Remember when Paul was going around the churches and asking for money to help the, Jeru uh, the, the, the people at Jerusalem because they were having trouble financially and, and, and uh, of course they, they, uh, there was a famine. He was going around. Uh, the church at Corinth is the church that he boasted of saying that these people have been trying to save money for almost a year now so that they can help the people at Jerusalem. Now this is a large amount of money. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, just a, a few amount. It's, it's actually a few churches giving him money to give to Jerusalem. And they're the ones carrying that. In order to be accountable, Paul doesn't do that alone. He is with other people. Okay, because he knows that he can be corrupted. He can be, he can be tempted to take the money for himself. So he said, we have defrauded no man. We have not taken advantage of you. All these things that we've taken from you, we've helped the Jerusalem people. All the things... Now, I'm talking about this because in the next chapter is going to talk about this. Now, because that is the context of this. So now, we have not, we have not taken advantage of you. Unlike compared to the man of God today, right? They have been taking your money and you don't know where it's been going. They have been taking, uh, they have been preaching in order for you to reach into your pockets and put it into the offering plate and you will not know at all where your money went. No accountability. They cannot stand behind the pulpit and honestly say, I have defrauded no man. Yeah. I don't know if they can honestly say that unless their conscience are seared. I have defrauded no man. You can, 
Praise the Lord that in our church we have a financial report. And you can see what's happening with the money that you're giving to the Lord. But there are churches in the Philippines where I studied seminary, you will never know what happened to your money. A pastor will stand and say, you've given your money to the church, now stop thinking about your money. You're already, you've already given it. Trust the pastor to do uh, what he thinks is right with your money. Well, a pastor can be good, a pastor can be righteous, a pastor can be spiritual, and still be uh, tricked by the devil to do bad things. Because it's just a man. Pastor is not God. That's why we, there's, there should be accountability to the members and to the pastors and to, and to the leaders of the church. We have defrauded no man, Paul said. Okay? I speak not, not this to condemn you. For I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with, live with you. Okay? The, now, Paul is say, saying all these things not to condemn them. But although Paul is really uh, 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 rebuking them. Because it's really it's possible here, in, in, in the conduct of Apostle Paul and his words, we learn that it's possible to, uh, to confront without condemning. It's possible to tell people about the wrong things they have done without being very disagreeable. And this is something that you, we, I personally had to learn as, 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 as I go on through studying the Word of God. Because as uh, I, I read a quote the other day on Facebook, like first year seminary students are always the ones who know a lot. Right? Because the moment that you start studying the Word of God, is, uh, that's the moment the devil will attack you. Right? The moment that you're, you're, you're taking in all this information, the moment that you start, the devil will already try to defeat you by putting pride in your mind and your heart. Now, you think that you know a lot already, or even though you've just started. So now, you can start rebuking people and condemning people. And well, that is not the, the, the job of, of the man of God. Paul says to speak the truth in what? In love. Now, it's possible, and he did that, to rebuke them, to be open to them, to be uh, straightforward with them without being condemning. Okay, hindi siya, he didn't come and say, hey, you're this, you're that, you're bad, you're going to hell. No. Yeah, the, the, he says that, I have done this um, out of love, I spoke the truth in love, and, and, and I have confronted, confronted you without condemning. He said, great is my boldness of speech toward you. I have been open to you. I have criticized you. Okay? I have told you this. I have not, uh, not sugar-coated the message. I have not... Uh, I have not... What's it called? I'm English. Watered down or I have not been deceitful in my, in my words to you. But I have been open. Okay? I have been straightforward. Because I have rebuked you. I have told you what you've done. But another th great thing or a great attitude of a man of God is he doesn't just rebuke. But he also encourages, said, great is my glorifying of you, glorying of you. Okay, if you remember the church at um, Macedonia, the church at Thessalonica, Paul has spoken so highly of the Corinthian people to them. He said, oh, these are examples. These Corinthian people are good people. These Corinthian people have been uh, good testimonies in their places that, 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 that you have to be challenged. They have been giving, give as well. They have been faithful, be faithful as well. So Paul says, I have not only criticized you, I have also praised you. Okay? I was also proud of you. Later on in this chapter, you can see that uh, Paul and Titus, uh, it's not the correct word. Ano ba sa English yung parang pustahan na hindi pustahan? Paul assured Titus that these Corinthian people are going to repent. Trust me. But Titus has been very uh, 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 skeptical of that. So they, they had this thing. Now, later on, we're going to see that Paul won. It's not a wager. It's not a bet. But it's just something that they think will happen. All right. So Paul has spoken highly of these people. You know, some, uh, sometimes uh, you, you can meet a, a preacher, a pastor who, who speaks rebuke all the time. That is fine. The Bible is profitable for rebuke. But it's also, it also has to be balanced. Has to be, you have, uh, you, uh, a preacher has to know to uh, praise someone as well. Not to praise in a fleshly manner, but to appreciate what you're doing for God. But then, as a, as a person, as a member who's listening, you have to accept the rebuke and the praise the same. Not only accept the praise and refuse the rebuke. Because most of the time, that's our attitude. Pagka tinamaan ka na, nakayo ko na. Pagka pabor sa'yo, nakatingin ka na naman sa preacher. Ay, nako, gets na mga preacher yan dito. Alam, alam nila sinasabi ko. Do you know what I'm saying? If, 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 if what we're saying is against your personal principle or, or, or it's rebuking you somehow, you see people put their heads down. 
they stop listening, they stop looking at you. But then when what you're saying is favorable, they look at you again and they smile and they say, Amen. You know, it's a blessing. One blessing here is to see, uh, when you stand here, is to see sinyung who's spiritual, who's carnal. You see, why? Because the sign of a carnal person is they choose, they pick and choose what they want to listen to. But a spiritual person accepts the word of God as it is. Okay? So, we have wronged no man, we have defrauded. He says that, I, I didn't do this to condemn you. I have been critical of you. I've been criticizing you, but I've also been boasting about you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Now, before I, I put this into context and in what he's telling the Corinthian people, let's look at that. I am exceeding joyful in tribulation. Because the life of a Christian is full, full of tribulation. We're not talking about the seven-year tribulation. We know, we, we, we believe that we're not going to experience that. But the life of a Christian is full of trouble. The Bible says, why are you, uh, in the book of James, uh, uh, why are you surprised that you're having trouble with your life? Why are you surprised that people are persecuting you? Jesus said, if they have done this to me, they will do that to you. Yeah. But the Bible says, through tribulation, don't, you have to be exceeding joyful. You have to rejoice. The Bible is not commanding us to be stoic throughout this tribulation time. It's like you're, you're, you're a stone, unmovable. But as well, but at the same time, no joy. You know, the Bible says patience in tribulation is active patience. Not that you're just standing and doing nothing, but as, as, but as you are uh, trying to endure tribulation, you find joy in doing that. Why? Why can you find joy? Because you experience God more. You experience the power of God more. The Apostle Paul says, uh, Therefore, I, I, I glory, rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. Because the, the weaker I am, the more infirmities I experience, the more harm people do to me, the more power God is bestowing upon me, the more grace God is giving to me, and I am enjoying that. Amen. Now Paul, uh, of all people, Paul says, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. While writing to these carnal people, there's no reason to, joy, to, to have joy. But then he said, I am exceeding joyful. Now, he says here, For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God, that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now, if we're going to look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, if, if, uh, can you please flash that? It says here, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Remember when I preached about this in this chapter, uh, Paul was, was having trouble. Paul and his company, they're waiting for Titus. Why? Because Paul has sent a letter to these Corinthian people through Titus. And he's been waiting word. Parabang excited siya. He's been thinking, are they going to receive my letter in the right way? Or are they going to be mo even more discouraged because of the letter? Because the letter here seemingly is a severe letter, a sorrowful letter, a letter that's filled with rebuke and sorrow, the sorrow that they have caused Paul. Now, Paul has written that. We don't have a copy of it in our Bible. Okay, we only have First and Second Corinthians. That letter is between that. Now, now Paul gave it to Titus and, ti and said, Titus, give it to them. See how they will respond. See what they're going to do about it and we'll wait for you. Now, Paul has been waiting for Titus, but he hasn't come. So they went to Macedonia. So from 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, until uh, chapter 7 here, it's like, um, parabang uh, patalastas. And then pagdating sa chapter 7, tinuloy na ni Paul. When Titus came, what happened? But uh, the, the Lord allowed this to happen because in the middle of those things, we have seen treasures. We have seen uh, encouragement and principles that Paul has written to the Corinthians that we can apply in our lives. So now, it, this is a continuation. He said that, Nevertheless, uh, uh, God, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. We see that Titus came. First, they were comforted because a, a, fellow, a fellow laborer has come, the presence. But also, they were comforted because he was bringing good news. Not bad news. Now, Paul has been worrying. Are they going to receive it uh, in a correct way or not? Titus thinks not. I think they will repent. Now he's waiting for Titus. Now he said, I, I, I have joy. 
Uh, now, I, I, I am joyful because Titus, Titus were here. He said that we were having trouble in Macedonia. What kind of trouble? Without were fightings. Uh, we, we were fighting with people who don't believe in Christ. Not, not, not fighting like punching or whatever. We have been, you know, the, you know the attitude of Paul. He always goes to synagogues and reason with people, debate with them, and, and, and convince them that Christ, Jesus, who they've crucified, is the Savior, is the Messiah, is the Christ. So that's what he's been doing. Not only uh, uh, um, uh, doing that with unbelievers, but he's also been uh, uh, playing this tug of war with believers who are seemingly going into the world. Now, without were fightings, and all these troubles that were happening from the outside. But we see here the heart of the Apostle Paul and, and, and the reality of a preacher or a leader within, inside, were fears. Now, however brave a man of God seems to be behind the pulpit, there are fears in their hearts. They are not superhuman. They're just like you and me. Preachers and pastors are just like you and me. They have fears. They have anxieties even more so because of all these people that God had entrusted to them. Now Paul, through his, through his fears, through anxiety, and, and all these things that he has experienced, uh, he, he's stressed, he's feeling the stress, he's feeling the peer, f- peer, fear, right? Without our fightings, within our fears. That's why uh, as, as members, we have to be a help and encouragement to our leaders, to our, especially to our pastor. Why? They have been carrying enough for you to even burden them with more. Okay, this, this is a good, this, uh, a, a good attitude that we can have. And not by His coming only. We're not only encouraged because He came, but by consolation wherewith He was comforted in you. Because of the news that, that He was comforted, that His mind were put, was put at ease because He has spent time with you. When He told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Now this proves that the Corinthian church has not altogether abandoned the Apostle Paul. Yes, it's true that there were false prophets who came in and tried to confuse them. And some were convinced that Paul was not really an apostle or whatever. But then, it says here through the the report of Titus, we see that God has been working still in that church. And then they have, they have still been open to, to, to what God wants, has to say and that they have repented of that. Okay, later we're going to see that. For though I made you sorry with a letter. This is the letter that we have been talking about. This is the severe letter that, we have, that I have been talking about. Now, let's try, to, let's try to put the timeline here. Paul started the church. Uh, one people to Christ taught them. And then because he's a missionary, he had to leave them. Now, the first time that he left them, he heard that there were trouble. There were sin in the church. There are people who are causing trouble, are living in sin. So what Paul did was, he went to the church and tried to correct matters. Tried to, to, uh, to put matters into place. Now, apparently, some were offended with his conduct. So when he left again, he heard right, that people were offended of what he did. So instead of going back again, because he thinks that they're going to be even be more offended of my presence, what he did was write this letter instead. Gave it to Titus. Titus let them read this. Now this is this letter. For though I made you sorry with the letter, you were sad because of this letter. I know you were sorrowful because of this letter. Okay? I do not repent, though I did repent. What this means is that when the moment I asked Titus to bring the letter, I was worried. I, was, I, I regretted writing some of those things. But now that I have good, heard good news, that the letter was, uh, has, has uh, produced great results in you, I do not repent. Now I don't regret it. Now Paul doesn't know everything, of course. It, although he's a great man of God, he doesn't know everything. He's even worried. He has anxieties. He has fears. He's, he's worried that this, he's going to lose these people uh, 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 for, forever. Why? Because he, he doesn't plan on going back. What he plans is for them to realize their mistake. But then uh, he came, Titus came, and he saw the good news. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry. Though it were but for a season. When we are being rebuked by the word of God, by the man of God, by a preacher, it will make you naturally become sad. Why? Because you see yourself in light of scripture and it's not according, your life is not according to scripture. Malulungkot ka talaga. Wala naman pinapagalitan na masaya. Okay? The, uh, uh, if, if, if a pastor or a preacher is, is rebuking you, you will not be happy at that moment. You're going to clap, you're going to laugh. That's not a good feeling, being rebuked. Oh, especially when you were a kid, when your dad is scolding you. 
Pag pinapalo ka, pagka pinagsasabihan ka, hindi masaya. But, he says here, for I perceive that the same piece of made you sorry, though it were but for a season. If you have a good attitude, the sorrow will not remain. There will be joy after that. Now I rejoice, Paul says, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. I'm happy not because you were sad, but because that sadness produced repentance. Now Paul here is differentiating the sorrow from repentance. Because you can be sorrowful without repenting. You can be sorry without repenting. Remember Peter when he was sorrowful because he denied Christ? He repented. But Judas, when he, he was sorrowful because Christ was crucified because of him, he killed himself. It's not necessarily that you were sorrowful because of your sin that you will repent. Okay? So the, the, what, what godly sorrow will produce repentance. So Paul said, I was not happy because you're sorry. As a father, as a person who loves you, I'm not happy that you're sad. But I have to say these harsh words to you. But I have to say these things to you. I, I have to tell you what God wants you to know. Even though I know you will be sad, even though I know this will not feel good, I have to do it. I'm not happy that I have to do it. But now I'm happy because it resulted into repentance in your life. Amen. That is the heart of the man of God. Wag po nating isipin na pagka ang pastor, ang preacher dito, na nenermo nagsisumisigaw, sinasabi ang ating mga mali, na masaya kaming ginagawa yun. No one is happy while, while, while rebuking people. No one is. The, uh, uh, a preacher or a pastor has the heart of a father. No one is, uh, even, even if you're scolding your, your kid, I, I, I don't think anyone enjoys spanking their kids. Can anyone say that? I'm happy that my kid is sad. I'm happy that I grounded my child. I'm happy that I was, I'm spanking my child. No one will be happy, but you know you have to do it. Why? Because it's good for them. Because if they have a good attitude and they repent, it will bring joy. But then, you have to do it because they have to realize what their, their mistake. That's why, magsaya, dapat po, masaya tayo pagka yung preaching, marami tayong rebuke na natanggap. That means marami tayong pwedeng gawing tama sa buhay natin. Minsan po talaga, mali lang ang attitude natin. Ang yabang naman itong preacher. Kala mo naman, wala siyang mali. Kala mo naman, ikaw perfecto. Eh di ba, lang, lang, wag na lang mag-preach. Wala naman pong perfecto dito. Sino po dito pwede magsabi, ako perfecto, ako mag-preach. Eh di wala na lang mag-preach. But, our authority rests on the Word of God. Amen. As long as we're preaching the Word of God, whether you like it or not, you have to submit. Amen. Whether you like it or not, you have to accept it as the Word of God and it's God talking to you and open your heart so that it will produce godly sorrow that, that results into repentance. Amen. Now, uh, he, said, he says here that uh, uh, repentance here, I, I just want to dwell on this, uh, sorrow and repentance because repentance in the first place is what God has saved. Now, repenting in itself doesn't uh, uh, save you, but it is part of what saved you. You will not be saved unless you repented of your sin. That is the, a lot of people saying that that is the first word of salvation. When, when John the Baptist preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When, when, when Jesus Christ started his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, his message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Peter started preaching, he said, repent. Paul is also asking people, even in, in Athens, to repent of their idolatry. If you have not experienced repentance, if you have not repented of your sin, it's sad to say you are not saved. It's sad to say there will never be new, uh, a new birth. There will never be salvation unless you have decided to repent of your sins. I'm not saying that once you repented, you're not going to commit it anymore. But you have changed your mind because of that. And that resulted in a change of life. Not only a change of man, but a change of life. Okay? That's why we can boldly say here that if a person professes to be saved, if a person professes to know God, but there's no change in their lives, they have not repented at all. And because they have not repented at all, they are not saved. I'm not judging. That's what the Bible says. I'm not judging. This is something that even Baptist churches are not preaching about anymore. Because we want numbers. Because we want people to come. We want people to repeat a prayer, pray after me, repeat this prayer, you're saved. Uh, uh, say this prayer and now you're saved. The Bible says, except ye repent, you will not be saved. Except you change your mind in your idolatry, in your sins, in your sinful living, you are not saved. That's why as I was studying this chapter, this chapter is the one that has talked to me more. 
Why? Because the life of a believer should be a life of repentance. And if you are not, if you are not being uh, uh, convicted to repent every day of your life, then you might not have repented in the first place. That's why a believer is not a life of a believer is not characterized by the sin you commit because you're going to commit sin. I'm going to commit sin. None of us here are perfect, but a believer's mark is that if you commit sin, you're able to repent. Not only to be sorrowful, but to be sorrowful that results into repentance. That's why you can see that some of the people here or most of the people here who repented are saved. Why? Because when they were sorrow sorrowful because of that letter, they repented. That's why delikado po. Pagka ang tao, pinakitahan mo na ng Bible, pinakitahan mo na ng mali ang ginagawa, at, at na-realize nila, kumatok ang Holy Spirit sa kanila at wala silang iniba, that is dangerous. It's either you're not saved or you just keep, you keep on grieving the Holy Spirit. And all of us are guilty of that. That's why those, time, those, were the time, those are the times that you doubt your salvation. Those are the times that you doubt, Lord, why can't I put this away uh, out of my life? But as, as long as you have that desire to do that, that is a mark that you are saved. And that you just have to keep on relying on the power of God to do that. Now, he says here, for you were made sorry after a godly manner. Now, that's why... It is important for preachers to preach in the right way. It's important for us to present the gospel when, when it comes to salvation in the right way. Because Paul says here, you were made sorry by me, by my letter, after a godly manner. Okay? Not by my own words, but what God wants you to know. Okay? Because there are preachers who will stand behind the pulpit and convict by, their, by themselves people of their sin without referring to the Bible. There are preachers who will scare you of hell. Oh, it's a very, very uh, bad place. You don't want to go to hell. Of course, no one wants to go to hell. Who here wants to go to hell? Okay, some people even say that I don't want my life to be hell because hell is negative, that's in our mind. But, but hell is a, uh, it's a completely different thing from what we're thinking. It is a scary place. It is a place that you don't want to be, but that's not the message. The message is simply that you're a sinner you have to repent. You don't have to add many things to that. You can emphasize it. You don't have to add to scripture. It's enough. That's why the Bible, uh, Paul says, I made you sorry after a godly manner. Okay, not just by my own devices. I did not, uh, hindi ko kayo niloko, hindi ako nagkaroon ng gimmick-gimmick para lang makonvict kayo. I merely told you what God wants me to tell you and that's it. Alright? That he might receive damage by us in nothing. Why? Kasi pagkasarili niya lang ang nag -rebuke. Pwedeng malungkot nga sila, ma-realize nga nila, pero madamage yung relationship. Kaya nga po, huwag sarili natin salita. Huwag sarili, why? Because kung ako lang magre-review, by my own words, by my own wisdom, pwede makarealize nga kayo, pero yung magibabago kayo sa akin. Pero if I rebuke you, using the word of God, you have no reason to, to, to uh, uh, our relationship doesn't have any uh, a reason to be affected. Okay? That's why I said, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. We are unblameable because of this. What I'm telling you is basically what God wants you to know. Why? For God's sorrow, godly sorrow, worketh repentance unto salvation. That's what I've been saying. You can be sorrowful but not be saved. You can be sorry but not be saved and not repent. That's why if anyone here in the midst, in, in our midst, if anyone here who thinks or who claims that I'm saved, I pray the prayer. I'm going to church. I, I have a Christian family. I have, I, have, I have married into a Christian family. And now I'm saved. No, the Bible says, unless you repent, you are not saved. Unless you were born again, you're not saved. Repentance and putting your faith in Christ goes together. You cannot separate that. You cannot just say, I trust God, but I don't want to repent of my uh, sinful life. That is simply not possible. It is the same time. You turn your back from sin and put your faith towards God. That's how you get saved. That's why sa, mga, sa, mga, uh, sa, sa atin po dito, unless sa buhay mo, nasasabi mo, hindi pa talaga ako nag-repent sa aking mga kasalanan, kapatid, hindi ka paligtas. Hindi pa talaga nagbago ang buhay ko, kapatid, hindi ka paligtas. If you haven't changed your mind about the Word of God, if you haven't changed your mind about the people of God, if you haven't changed your mind about the ministry of God and about your relationship with God, you are not saved. It's simple as that. The, the book of uh, um, 1 John. I forgot. 1 John is full of, of, is full of um, uh, 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 marks of a true believer. 
Because uh, salvation will produce repentance and true repentance will change your life. Okay? So for godly sorrow, worketh repentance unto salvation. Kasi hindi naman palungkutan yan. Pwede ka magrepent na hindi ka na masyadong lumungkot. Pwede ka na naman malungkot na malungkot, hindi ka naman nagrepent. Hindi po palungkutan. Okay? Uh, uh, the, what the question here is uh, do you repent do you change your mind uh, towards this sin and these Corinthian people have a lot to repent of you can pick and choose people have been glorying in sin people have been doubting the man of God they have to repent of all these things for God is sorrow work at repentance to salvation not to be repented of but the sorrow of the world work at death that means kung ka man, but then it resulted into repentance don't regret it Okay? That is what, the, what it's saying. For behold, the selfsame thing, that ye sorrow after a godly sword, what carefulness it wrought you. Now, in this verse, Paul is telling them what, what's the result of repentance in their lives. It says, what carefulness it wrought you. Carefulness. True repentance will produce carefulness. Carefulness here means diligence or faithfulness. If, if you really turn your back from sin, we need to be diligent in order to remain turned from sin. Kasi hindi po given na tinalikuran mo ng kasalanan, hindi ka nakaharap ulit. Okay? What I mean is, it's, it's, it's not automatic that you repented of your sin and you're not going to commit any sin anymore. That's not a given. That requires effort. Now, but true repentance will give you that diligence to keep on turning away from sin. Okay? What carefulness it wrought you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Is that the, the next one? Yeah. Carefulness it wrought you. What... La, what clearing of yourselves. Now, true repentance will give us confidence because we have left sin. It's that we have been cleared. Well, yung consensya natin malinis. Why? Because we have truly repented. Yea, what indignation. Indignation here means displeasure or annoyance. That means, hindi ka na masaya sa kasalanan. Pag tunay ka nag-repent, you will not be happy in sin anymore. Yes, you might still fall once in a while. Yes, you might still commit sin. But you hate that you do it. You don't rejoice anymore. Now, you say, what's the difference? A Christian commits sin, an unbeliever commits sin. The difference is what happens after the sin. A believer is not happy that he was able to commit sin. A believer, uh, an unbeliever might be happy because he committed sin. Okay? That's the difference. Indignation. Yea, what fear? You will fear falling into that power of sin again. You will, you will have that fear. Matatakot ka nang gumawa ng kasalanan. That yun yung lagi sinasabi ni, ni, ni uh, Kuya Alex dito. Ang tunay na ligtas, nakalimutan ko yung mga words ni Kuya Alex eh. Hindi, we don't commit, we don't do, we commit sin, we might fall to sin, but we don't do it. It's not our lifestyle anymore. Okay, because we're afraid to do it. Why? Because we've seen the power, God has removed us from that power, and we should be afraid to do that again. What vehement desire. That means now our desire is going to change. It's not towards sin anymore. Our desire is towards righteousness. Kaya nga, guard po natin ang ating puso. Ano yung desire mo? Are you desiring to do what's good? Are you desiring to do what's right? Or do you still desire to do these wrong things in your life? There's something wrong pagka ganun po ang desire natin. That means, if you truly repented, your desire is toward the things of God now. Hindi ka na tinatamad dito. Hindi ka na tinatamad sa Bible study. Hindi ka na tinatamad sa pagbabasa ng Bible. Hindi ka na tinatamad sa preaching. Why? Because this is your desire. If you're doing what you desire, you're happy. That's why it's a question mark if a person comes to church during Sunday and you're not happy. Why? Isn't this your desire? Or are you just here because you have to be here? Check attendance. Because pastor is going to talk to me if I don't go to church. No, this should be your desire. That's why if you desire to come here, you're going to come with a joyful mind, joyful attitude. You're going to sing praises to the Lord. Minsan, maputol na litid ni Cedric, ayaw pa kumanta ng iba. What, what is your desire? That means your heart is not here. That means your mind is somewhere else. That you rather do something else than be here. Okay? True repentance will change your desires. Okay? What revenge? The word revenge here, oh no, what zeal? Okay, zeal towards the things of God, zeal in doing good works. I'm sorry, my daughter. What revenge? Okay, the word revenge here is in, in, in the Greek, ekdikesis, which means vindication. Okay, that means if you have truly repented, you will receive vindication from people who have known your life before. It's not you who did that, but God will show that to them. 
Ibig sabihin, if I may speak in Tagalog, marami tayong kaibigan dati, alam nila ang buhay natin. Pero kung tunay ka nag-repent, mismong sila magsasabi, tunay na naligtas ito. Hindi sila magdududa. Because you've received vindication. You might have been doing the things that they were doing before. They might have known the sinful you. But if you have truly repented, they cannot deny the fact that you have changed. Walang duda, hindi po malabo. Ibig sabihin, doon na yung papasok yung aasarin ka nila. Uy, masyado ka naman ng banal. That's good, because they see something. Masyado naman na yan. That's good, because they see something. Pero kung wala man silang nababanggit, o wala man talaga silang nakita pagkakaiba, kapatid, salita lang ang repentance mo. Walang tunay na repentance. You're going to be vindicated. God is going to do that. God is going to use your life, your changed life, in order for them to see, hey, there's something in that Christian life. There's something in that Jesus Christ. There's something in that Christianity and I want my life to be like that. And someday God might work in their lives because of what you have shown. Now that is true repentance. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now Paul is now, para bang nawala na ng bigat yung kanyang mga salita. Diba? Galit siya, all of these things, a sorrowful letter and a severe letter, but now he says that because of this good news, I am now joyful to know that you have repented of what you have done. That is the heart of the man of God. Kahit na gaano pa kasakit, minsan magsalita, ang gusto lang magbago tayo. Kahit na gaano pa kasakit, minsan ang, 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 ang naririnig natin ang mga pinipreach dito sa pulpito, ang gusto lamang po ng mga nag, 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 nagpipreach, gusto lamang po ng mga preachers ng ating pastor, ay maipabuti ang ating buhay. Wala po sa amin dito na gustong masira kahit sino dito. Wala po. That is the heart of a man of God. I cannot speak for other preachers, but I can speak and see that this is the desire at least of Paul and the people who are really studying the Word of God. Now, clear in this matter, what matter? Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I didn't write for his cause. Hindi ko, hindi ako sumulat para dun sa nagkamali. Okay, he's talking about a person here. Nor for his cause that suffered wrong, or dun sa ginawa ng mali. But that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Hindi ko sinulat yung letter na yun para kampihan yung nagkamali o kampihan yung ginawa ng mali. No. I'm just telling you what you did wrong, but I wrote that letter because I love you. Because we care for you so that you can see that. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Remember, Titus was skeptical. Sabi niya, uh, Titus, maybe Tit here in the words of Apostle Paul, we can assume that Titus was thinking, hey, it's not going to work. These people are carnal. These people are doing what's wrong. Maybe they're not even saved. It's, a, it's useless for me to go there and read this letter. Maybe that's his attitude. But he says, but Paul says, not only were we joyful because you repented, but we were even more joyful because Titus has changed his mind. He has been com uh, refreshed because of what he has seen in your life. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, pinagmayabang ko kayo sa kanya, I am not ashamed, hindi niyo ako pinahiya. Okay? But as we speak all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. Nakita ni Titus na tama pa rin sinabi ko, magre-repent yung mga, it's gonna work. Now, it's, it's like I can imagine Paul saying to Titus, I told you so. Right? Sabi ko sa'yo eh. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you. Whilst he remembered the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye receive him. Now because of this, uh, Titus loved them even more. The last verse says, I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. Paul was a very hopeful man of God towards these people. He was very hopeful. He had all the confidence in the world to these Corinthian people. Although he has all the reason not to take care of them anymore. What heart the Apostle Paul has. Even though these people have committed sin after sin, doubted him and doubted him, did things that to make him sorrowful, he was still the one who is hopeful that they will change. And it has been rewarded. They repented. Maybe not all of them, but at least a number that made the Apostle Paul joyful, even through the tribulation that they were experiencing there in Macedonia. The fightings without fears within, but Titus came with this good news, I am now exceeding joyful, Paul says. That is the heart of, a, of the man of God. Kaya po ang challenge ko, my challenge to you this morning is, the men of God who are preaching here loves you. Amen. It's not a question. Okay? If we don't, we're not gonna preach. Right? It's, it's very tiring to preach. 
Now I realize it's even more tiring to preach Saturday and then Sunday. Now I appreciate what our pastor appreciated more. Because every time, dati nag-preach ako hapon lang, pagpasok ako sa, sa school, pagod na pagod ako sa gabi. Pero nakakapagod din po pala talaga. Lalo na kung nagpipreach ka na talagang binibigay mo. Meron nagpipreach na nagkikwento lang, hindi mo mapapagod. Pero po talaga yung, yung, yung thinking, yung, 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 yung utak, gumagana, nakakapagod. Lalo na kung medyo mahina talaga yan. Mapapagod ka lalo. Na? Kaya nga po, that's why when they preach here, they encourage you. They, 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 we, uh, we try to rebuke you. Now the thing here is, we are doing these things. We're steering your emotion. We're using the Word of God. Our goal is for everyone, including ourselves, to be able to repent of the things that we see in the Word of God. Kaya po pag nakita nyo na parang ako yung pinapatamaan, sige ikaw na. Ang tanong, anong gagawin mo? Because of that. Sige ikaw na ang pinapatamaan, sige na ikaw na ang title ng preaching. Okay, sige, sabihin na natin yun na. Anong gagawin mo? Dahil ba ikaw ang pinatamaan? Because you said that I'm not going... Bala ko na sana magrepente. Eh. Kaso sinabi mo, wag na lang. Ganun po ba yung attitude natin? Now, my challenge is, how do you respond to the Word of God? How are you? The Corinthian people responded the right way. They have the Holy Spirit. How are you going to respond? I believe that the uh, uh, preachings here have been tough to some of you. Even to us, it has been tough. Why? Because we see ourselves in the light of scriptures and we fall short every time. We're the first ones who find ourselves short every time whenever we're studying the Word of God. It's like, I'm not even worthy to preach this looking at my life, but I have to do it. I've been called to preach. I will do it. But then the question is, now that you see that, are you going to repent? It's sad. I'm sorry to say that if you do not find it in your heart, the desire to repent after you hear the Word of God, you have to repent unto salvation. Because the mark of a true believer is he's able to repent every day to cleanse yourselves, not only cleanse yourselves of, of, of fleshly sins, but also your spirit, and you keep doing what is right towards God. What is your response to the Word of God? I pray, I hope and I pray that if you see yourselves dito, and you check your heart, I, hey, you mga, some of these things I've already been doing in your life, I pray that you'll pray to God that you will able, you'll be able to keep doing that. But if you see yourself that you have to check something in your life, that there's a desire in your heart that's not according to the Word of God, that you repent of it today, now. And if you see yourself, a preacher, I think I'm not saved in the first place. Because I have not done that repentance thing you're talking about. You're talking about. All I know is I pray the prayer, and invite ako sa church, umatend ako, may nako mausap sa akin, tapos sabi, ligtas na ako. Pero, Ngayon ko lang narinig yung kailangan palang magbago ang buhay. Dapat pala mayroong resulta. Dapat pala, nagbago ang isip ko sa kasalanan. Dapat pala, kung tunay ako nagdaliktas, kung totoo ako naliktas, hindi ko nagugustuhin yung mga mali. Parang hindi yun ang naisabi sa akin. Kapatid, ibig sabihin nun, hindi ka tunay na naligtas. And it's a blessing na narinig mo ito ngayon, ibig sabihin, may chance kang maligtas. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to repent. For believers, now is the time that you repent of the things that we have been doing wrong. For unbelievers, if you are, don't have that relationship with Christ, now is the time to open your heart to the Spirit, Holy Spirit of God and repent of your sins and put your faith in the finished work of God. I pray that this will, one of this will be our decision. Whatever your situation is, whatever is happening in your life, you see yourself in the, word of, in the light of the Word of God. Now repent. Repent of what you've been doing. Believe it or not, repent of what you've been doing wrong. And let us change our minds to the Word of God, or whatever uh, we, we think of the Word of God. Let us all stand and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for uh, the message. We thank you for 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We thank you, Lord, that uh, as we have been studying the book of 2 Corinthians from 1, for chapter 1 to 6, we see that it's, it seems like these people have been... Uh, too far away from you that no one that there's nothing Paul can do to uh, to really uh, pull them back into your will but Lord this has been an encouraging chapter because we see that 
uh, through all the effort of, the, of, of, of Paul, through all your work in their lives, that they were able to repent and to go back to your will and to do what is uh, right according to your sight, dear Lord. Now, Lord, I pray that uh, you help us this morning make a decision in our lives, a decision for the better, a decision, dear Lord, to say that I'm going to repent of the wrongdoings in my life and I'm going to start following the Lord. And I pray, dear Lord, that you will give this into our, that into our heart to help us do that uh, this morning. So, uh, so I give this invitation sa mga, uh, 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 mga Kristiyano po dito, kung meron po kayo nakita sa inyong buhay, na kailangan po nating uh, 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 baguhin, kailangan natin palitan, wag po natin patikasin ang puso natin. Let us come to God in repentance. And, and kung ikaw nakita mo ngayong umaga na if you see in your life that you're not really saved, you haven't really repented, you're, you don't really have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that we have been talking about, that we have been seeing in the Bible, I pray that you come to the Lord and, and repent of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ kasi hindi mo kayang iligtas ang sarili mo. Hindi yung sarili mong gawa, hindi yung sarili mong alam, ang Diyos lang ang makakapagligtas sa'yo and only sa decision mo na magrepent at ilagay ang, ang iyong faith sa, uh, sa ating Panginoon, that is the way you're going to be saved. The Bible says, unless you repent, you will not be saved. You will not be saved from the eternal punishment of sin. If that is your desire as, as an unbeliever today, if you see that in your life, I pray that you make that decision. All important, the most important decision you can make in your life is to repent of your sins and accept the Lord Jesus Christ. If you see these things in your lives, I pray that you come this morning and pray to the Lord here in the altar.